welcome to episode two of the Big Game Indicating Dogs Hunter series. So in this video we're going to be showcasing three different hunts. Firstly one where Paul got up with both dogs, uh, fly and print up uh, Wairiri Falls. And we've got a really good example of an indirect indication which is something that we go over in the deer dog training blueprint. I shot a nice winter yearling hind which is a really good meat animal and on the second hunt Luke went with River into the Kaimais again. Uh, we had no wind, so we had a bit of a tricky hunt. I took a few aspects off the, off the blueprint and um, it really ended up paying off. And then finally, I continued my mission to shoot a long range deer in the Kaimai high country. And um, this time I had some really good conditions in a nice area and managed to um, shoot another yearling hind at 400 metres. If you want to do this yourself, You've got everything that you need to do it and train your own dog and, and hunt like this the way we do with these dogs in the Deer Dog Training Blueprint and the links are in the description below. For now we'll get into this episode, I hope you enjoy it. So my first hunt was back up Wairiri Falls. This was the first hunt hunting print and fly together. I only hunt with one dog out in front at a time and I had the other dog in at heel and when I got up and heading towards the area I, I wanted to hunt for the day. There was this hunter's boot marks just heading straight out that way, so I um, changed my plan up a bit, crossed the river and just traveled for two or three k's to get right out into another area, sort of for safety. Just started bush hunting for the day, getting onto some really good sign, the dogs were indicating well. Um, at one stage, we were really close to an animal, print was sneaking and pointing and indicating and it was right in front of us. Um, I think I might have even heard it a couple of times. But again, as often happens with when you've got a dog that keeps taking you to these animals and indications in difficult country like this, we didn't quite catch up with it and the deer just kept slipping away and, and um, eventually got into some really difficult bush. And um, I just pulled him off and we, we carried on. Then we got onto another really good, nice direct wind um, with an animal right there. I could actually smell the deer myself. Um, print was indicating, and we snuck down and followed that up. And again, and the deer just led us down into some really tight bush. And this is at that point where you're tossing up whether to keep following the dog or not, and you have that option to actually turn the dog away from an animal it's trying to take you to. There's some key points on this early on when you're training a younger dog that we all go over in the blueprint. Um, but I'm at the stage now where I can actually pull print off animals, give them some praise, and it's not really affecting his drive to hunt. So that's what I ended up doing there. And then really shortly after that, pretty much almost the end of my hunt for the day, and print started tracking a mark really keen and it was a really fresh mark heading down a, a ridge straight in front of me um, but I had an angled wind coming from like about two o'clock with the animal walking out in front of me so I knew if we caught up to this animal um, we weren't going to have that nice direct wind um, and this is where we get what we call indirect indications where the dogs basically tracking or taking us towards the animal or into the right area and we're getting just enough information to know that there's an animal right there somewhere, but we know the dog can't get that direct indication because the wind isn't right. So printer just started tracking this fresh mark and I thought, man, this is the classic case scenario where I can get that good indirect indication. And I, so I slowed down and I just started using my eyes and within about 20 meters, I looked up to my left um, and there was just this yearling hind just walking through the bush there. Um, got some good footage of her just cruising. In this hunt, I was hunting with the 300 Blackout and the Lehigh Subsonics. He just took the shot, the shot was good. Uh, she ran about 20 metres. Just a classic case of kind of the dogs getting it in the area of the animals um, and also just print tracking that fresh mark there and, and acting a bit keen. So I just slowed down, I had my eyes peeled and 
and there you go and um, this will be a really good eater nice young red hind she's a pretty good nick so um, print's already trying to get started there so I better do my knife work and get out of here so I really like this winter hunting because we're in a position where the hinds young from the season before are old enough where they can look after themselves and all the stags are in hard antler um, so there's really you're not in that situation where you are in summer where you might not want to shoot a stag in velvet or you don't know what hinds you can and can't shoot because you don't know who's got a fawn tucked away somewhere. So it really frees us up just to hunt over the dogs and we can shoot basically whatever deer we want. Well, I've just got home from the Kaimais. Prince Laxon by the fire on the rug. Check out this venison. This is Kaimai Winter Yearling Hind. It does not get much better than that. So we've got the curry coming on here. Just frying off some venison. I've already got my curry sauce here. And I'm just, as I fry off each piece of back steak, <clears throat> I just dice it up and throw it in the curry sauce. I just got a message from Luke. He shot a stag today, so it's bloody good. It's another Kaimai mission where we've both shot a deer each on the same day. <laughs> Yo! Bugger? Yeah. As you remember from episode one, River got onto uh, his first proper track and wind indication on a young stag. And uh, we got that one in the bag. Uh, this second hunt here, he's 11 months old. Yes, I'm just seeing um, all of that training from the blueprint uh, really falling into place. So I took him back up into the central Kaimai there in our backyard. We pushed up into an area where the bush opens up a bit. And a couple of times Riv took me off the track and we're tracking big round um, tracks and ended up right back where we, where we were at the start. You know, deer often do the, when they're feeding, they'll do big loops and things like that. And, and you know, I'd give them the benefit of the doubt and then smell deer and see a real fresh sign, but nothing really productive coming out of it. So then I keep pushing forward and, um, you know, probably around 11.30 a.m. we got into an area where um, we kind of, there's a creek and, and we've got walls sort of up on both sides acting like a big wind funnel. And, and there was just a gentle breeze coming down and roof started to uh, scent and he was trying to get up quite high like he'd go up and get up on logs and he was pacing and just getting his nose in the wind and as we got out of that that gut uh, there was no wind again and it was kind of you know back and forward and I just thought you know I'll just keep taking him in that direction and we'll see what happens so we cut down and got down into a big really bad gut you know with a big muddy wall it was probably three or four stories high I had to climb sort of you know, hanging off trees and stuff, and uh, as he got up over the top, I heard a, a huge commotion. He'd taken me right into that stag, um, where, where the stag was bedded. I put him back in front, we just kept going forward, and he was tracking running marks. He was just staying nice and close in front with his nose to the ground, and I looked up in front of him at about sort of 40 to 50 yards, um, I could see the stag just peering around a tree, looking straight back at us. Riv obviously didn't know it was there because he didn't have that wind, but he knew it had been right the way through there and, and he was tracking perfectly. Riv took me up some real bad stuff, real nasty little bit. It stunk like a stag. You know, you can see something's been running through. There was a um, stag just standing there at about 40 yards. So I didn't have time to get the camera going, I just poleaxed him, so. And I think he was just curious as to what was crashing around, so he just sort of stopped and he turned around and looked back. Bit, bit of a bugger, I couldn't get it on film, but oh well. Yeah, got it done. So that's his second deer up here, the second official deer up here, and this is his second stag up here. He's obviously been fighting, but yeah, pretty stoked. In society, we have a lot of people that are very separated from the um, the meat that they eat, 
Uh, there's not a lot of people, you know, that could say that they have looked the animal in the eye that they actually eat in. And to be able to have the dog as, as a tool for that, it's something that, that humans have been doing for, um, you know, tens of thousands of years. Back steaks out, uh, quarters out, so mincing the thighs, uh, hocks go in the slow cooker, which is really awesome, and back steaks, just fry as steaks. Three for three, eh, hey, old Riv? Here, Riv. Here, yeah. Riv. Three for three in the Kaimai's Riv, boy. Hey, Print, that's Riv's steak. You buddy, <laughs> too. <laughs> yeah, he's guarding it. Print, come here. Up on the rug. Lay down. Good boy. So on my second hunt in the Kaimai's, um, I headed back up into the Kaimai high country. I really had the weather conditions on my side this time. It was just perfect, uh, really cold winter weather, um, but with nice fine still days, so really good for glassing and long range shooting. I climbed up to an area that I'd spotted on Google Earth um, of some nice eastern facing slips. And I made a nice vantage point there, had to move a bit of foliage and set up a nice area to sit down in glass, you know, set up a, a spot to rest my rifle and ready to shoot. So in this vantage point, I had shooting options anywhere from about 50, 60 metres right out to about six or 700 metres. So, um, and some really nice slips there. It felt really good. It felt like I should see a deer there. And I spent the whole afternoon glassing, we got five or six hours. Um, without seeing anything. So I eventually packed up and started heading back to camp. And um, just as I was coming down a ridge above camp there, um, both dogs gave a really good indication down into an area down to my right, but it was too dark um, and late by then. And um, I just pulled them off and just kept heading back to camp. So the next morning, I was basically making a direct beeline straight around to the area that I'd set up the day before that vantage point where I'd glass from and I felt quite confident that I'd see a deer there because those slips were eastern facing and it was a really cold morning and they were going to get that good sun as soon as the sun started coming up so I felt like there'd be deer coming out into the sun. I was heading straight for there, come over a rise and sort of looked into a, a area it was really steep and dark and cold it just didn't look like the sort of area that would um, really warrant much attention, you know, I was actually stopping and glassing. But then I realized it was the area that the dogs were actually winding into the night before on my way out. So I really had to stop and tell myself to take my pack off and pull my binoculars out and glass that area. And it was quite a hard case. I actually pulled the binoculars out, lifted them up to my eyes. And as soon as I did that, there was a hind standing right in the middle of my um, field of view. I felt like she was probably about to walk back into the bush and out of view for the day. So I was quite, I was rushing to get all my gear set up, um, pull my range finder out. Ranged her at 400 meters, so it was quite a long shot. So um, I'm running a good dialing scope and I was in a, I used a ballistics app on my phone. Uh, so I was putting all the, uh, putting all the range in and um, dialing the scope and setting up the camera um, on, the, on the deer and getting everything set up. Jumped in behind the gun, made the shot, it was a good solid hit. As soon as I hit her, she actually come um, bounding down the slip and then turned into some really nasty vegetation that was just off to the side of the slip and she carried, covered a good 15 meters before she went out of sight and then I heard her crashing after that as well. Um, so I knew it was going to be a good find for the dogs. As soon as I fired the shot, I had a bad feeling because the setup for the shot had been really rushed. And I looked across to the camera and it wasn't recording. I'd set up and I had the hind perfectly in shot and it was everything I wanted for the blueprint. And um, <laughs> I wasn't recording, I was just really gutted. I had the GoPro set up on me, so you had all that. Um, I sort of sat there for a while, just, <laughs> I didn't even know what to say, I was just, yeah, gutted. So, but yeah, eventually I sort of calmed down and, and realised I had everything I needed. The main part for the blueprint um, that I really wanted to film was the dogs finding the deer at long range. So it's right over there on the top of a really nasty looking slip. 
very steep stuff, very nasty kind of scrub. My job is really just to get the dog to where the deer was when I shot it and the dog just takes over from there. It's hard case a couple of things here. One, beautiful and sunny over this side as the sun rises in the east. Horrible and cold over this side. This deer was out on the cold side. Um, and also I come down this ridge last night and both dogs were winding very keen over that side right where this deer's come out. It just shows you deer are where you find them when you find them there. We don't actually do any blood tracking work in the blueprint. Um, I've never done this myself. I've never found it necessary. When you hit a deer and you wound it, they do a big stressed out pheromone scent dump. Just in my experience, I've done it time and time again where I've trained dogs with the blueprint system. I've shot a deer in amongst a mob of animals and we've got all our commands set up. We've done our scent work with deer skin and our dogs know how to track and we've got all our range and everything set up. And we just take the dog over, give it the walk in front command and they just put their nose down and take us straight to that wounded deer, straight to the deer that we've shot. So yeah, in this case, it's really just my job to take a very good note of where the deer was standing when I shot it use landmarks, whatever I need to do to do that, and then get myself and my dogs to that point and just let the dogs track from there. In this case, like usual, there was, even though I didn't see any other deer with that deer that I shot, there was a lot of fresh sign around from multiple deer that had been in that area, but um, the dogs just hooked straight on to the track from that deer that I'd hit and just followed them. I was using print, had print out in front this time, and. Um, he just took me straight down the slip and into the bush where the deer had gone and then 20 metres down into the bush and straight to the deer. I didn't really see any blood or anything, but mind you, I, I wasn't even looking. I just followed the dog. It was in some pretty nasty, tight bush and it's definitely the sort of animal that could have been really hard to find on my own um, and it could have even been possible to, to lose it altogether. It was about 70 metres away from where I originally hit it. Dogs on long range hunts like this definitely are very, very useful. Um, and they pretty much eliminate the loss of shot deer. That's very good. Why doesn't really like being in front of the camera when I'm talking and getting her to sit by a deer and take photos. That's very good. It's cool to have both the dogs out together. I don't need to leave one behind anymore. And we're hunting. Yeah, so I mean, this was another really nice meat animal, another one, winter yearling hind, um, just really prime meat. And again, just took back stakes and hindquarters and um, nice cool conditions. So I got the skin off it and hung it up and let it cool down. Um, I could have quite easily just beeline straight to that vantage point and sat there all day glassing and shot nothing. So could have quite easily been the difference between, you know, shooting something and not shooting anything. And from there, just, yeah, pretty much loaded up another heavy pack of <laughs> gear and venison to carry out of the climb-wise, which we've been doing quite a bit of lately. Yeah, it was another really good hunt. So by the time you're watching this, um, part 12 of the blueprint is now out. So the Deer Dog Training Blueprint is now a complete system. If you're not familiar with the Deer Dog Training Blueprint, it's a 12 part, month by month video course where you follow the training of a deer dog from start to finish. Um, in the system we follow print, which is the dog you've seen in these hunter episodes. So it's over 12 hours in total of training footage. Everything from the first minute when I get him home, all of the training I've done, absolutely everything I do with my dog, filming everything we do the first time we do it, including right through to hunting and the filming of shooting his first nine deer over a three month period. We also show you a lot of hunting with Fly, who is my older, more experienced dog. She's three and a half years old and I've shot over 500 animals over in the bush. So that gives you a snapshot of what you can expect to see from your dog in two or three years time. Fly is actually a versatile dog who will hunt um, pigs, goats, deer, whereas Print is a target specific dog at the moment. We we're showing you how to keep it specific to one species. 
So our dogs are fully trained roughly around a year old. The blueprint is designed to train a dog to the point where its first hunt is perfect. Um, for Luke, that was at around 10 months old with River. Um, I didn't hunt print till he was about 14 months old. Um, we've had other people following the blueprint that have been hunting successfully with their dogs when they're eight months old. Um, and we've, we have other people that are training, retraining older dogs with the blueprint with their dogs that are up to seven years old. So it really works from ideally if you buy a pup and you follow the blueprint right from the start or right through to retraining your older dog. Um, so thanks for watching another one of our Big Game Indicating Dogs Hunter Series episodes. Um, remember to, to subscribe to the channel. Um, jump over and follow us on Facebook. And um, check out the link in the description to the blueprint.